Hi everyone, we're going to get started. So we now, we're on day two of Supply and Command. Thank you all for coming and thank you to our panelists. Um, a very brief recap of last night. It was a really, really nice kickoff to the event. Um, we started with a screening of Natasha Raheja's Cast in India, which is a really phenomenal film. If you haven't seen it, I would try to find a way to get access. You can find her work um, online. Uh, it's a phenomenal film about the manholes in New York City, and I think she was saying, a th I think I have this right, someone correct me, a third of the manholes uh, that across the entire U.S., or maybe it's New York City, I'm not sure, I think the U.S., are from this one foundry. Is that possible in India, in Howrah? Um, or at least the third of the ones from New York City. Anyway, so it was a phenomenal um, sort of sensory ethnography of the manholes, the manhole foundry um, in Howrah, so I would, I would check that out if you can. Um, uh, I want to say, um, as I did last night, thank you, as, as Matt and I both did, um, to, to Dove, Carlisa, Tracy, and Shima. Um, and also a thank you to Becky Amato from the Urban Democracy Lab. Um, these first two morning panels are co-sponsored by the Urban Democracy Lab. They are very excited about these panels. Um, and if you don't know the Urban Democracy Lab, uh, please also check them out. They're a lab here uh, at NYU. They have um, a doctoral fellowship program, and they do a really phenomenal programming. So um, thanks to Jean-Paulo Baiocchi um, and, and, and Rebecca Amato from Urban Democracy Lab. Um, we're very excited to be putting conversations about logistics and supply chains um, in conversation with media studies. And so a lot of themes about sort of how we, um, how we sort of talk about and theorize uh, and think through sort of the empirics of supply chains and logistics generally in, uh, in the realm of media and communication studies has been a really interesting conversation and one that we're excited to keep building. Um, and I'll just share a few of those sort of Briefly, a few of the fun, of more of the, the sort of funner themes that came up uh, last night, um, the sort of sensory experience of manholes, uh, surveillance, the sounds of logistics, Kafka and self-optimization, salt as media, salty managers, uh, sleeping on the job, these kinds of things. So um, we're excited to continue the conversation today. Um, and I'll remind everybody we have a hashtag, now that I'm a new Twitterer, tweeter, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag supply and command, all spelled out. Um, yes, so we'll start with our first panel. Um, a, just a brief introduction of the panel. Um, this one is Supply Chain Cities, and we have Yair Rubenstein on the Uberization of Everything, Life and Labor in the Logistical City, Niccolo Cupini, Infrastructural Media and Labor Conflict in Northern Italy, Sylvia Lintner, Pleasures of the Hack, Machines, Markets, Supply Chains, China, and Guillermo Leon Gomez, Logistical Paradise, Zones of Exclusion, and Panama's First Port City. So thank you very much, and we'll turn it over to Yair. So do you need to do anything with the... Yeah, just hit uh, show. Uh, actually... I'm going to say one more thing. I'll be, I'll be uh, giving people um, time signs, five minutes, one minute, and time. So uh, please stay attentive to time, but no need to rush through, uh, and I'll be right up there. How much time? Uh, 20 minutes uh, max. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, everyone, so much for coming this morning and to the organizers of this conference. Um, Basically, uh, just to provide a little context for this paper, um, it's part of uh, my dissertation project that I'm currently in the middle of. And it's basically um, trying to kind of extend the logic of uh, global supply chains to um, the, the gig economy, for lack of a better word. So it's kind of thinking of logistical rationality being extended into forms of service labor. Um, so. That's giving a little background. Uh, I go into a little bit about logistics, but mostly it's going to be about the kind of structure of, of labor for workers in the gig economy. So, <clears throat> uh, The HBO comedy series High Maintenance humorously depicts the vagaries of modern day life in New York City. Each episode consists of two to three different vignettes that follow a revolving set of characters, usually a young cosmopolitan couple or a single middle class professional. What unites them all is their mutual reliance on the same pot dealer, who the show only ever refers to 
and a nice touch of social realism as the guy. As the show's protagonist, we follow the guy around New York City as he makes his deliveries and unwittingly gets entangled in his clients' comedically complicated lives. From the perspective of his clients, the guy is a trusted confidant, an outsider who can offer an objective perspective and a level of candor that's sorely lacking with their significant others. Dispensing his priestly wisdom through a cloud of cannabis, the guy is a thread which knits together the loose community of pot smokers that make up the show's narrative world. As the show's title alludes to, the guy's job is not only to deal pot, but to maintain his community with a kind of care work and emotional labor that extends far beyond a dispassionate transactional exchange of cash for illicit substances. Redefined as a form of reproductive labor, high maintenance replaces drug dealing's former place in pop culture's criminal underworld with a cosmopolitan network of mostly white couples contending with the pressures of bourgeois society. But beyond its ideological recoding of pot as thoroughly upper middle class recreational drug, harder drugs of course remain too risque for bourgeois domestication. I want to suggest that the show is also indicative of the cultural and economic tropes that characterize what has come to be known as the gig economy. The gig economy, as I defined for the purposes of this paper, is a form of online labor arbitrage, wherein customers solicit various forms of service labor from platforms that are provided to them through their computer or mobile phone. Whether that involves hailing a ride from your Uber app, commissioning a programmer on Mechanical Turk to compile a set of code, or finding someone on TaskRabbit to apologize to your boyfriend on your behalf. That's actually a real example, by the way. <laughs> the gig economy facilitates all kinds of service labor available on demand. While not necessarily a legally sanctioned arm of the gig economy, the guy on high maintenance is in many ways its most ideal typical worker. First, he satisfies many of the gig economy's technical protocols. We watch in each episode how he relies on his cell phone to navigate the demands of his clients who are spread across the city. Like other gig workers, his phone puts him on call nearly 24 hours a day. From responding to his clients' emergency weed shortages, along with scheduling regular deliveries, the guy, uh, the guy is a gig worker par excellence. But his archetypal role in the gig economy is expressed not only by the formal composition of his labor, the guy also represents the gig economy's desire to deracinate its growing pool of contract workers. Thus, as I argue in this paper, high maintenance reclasses drug dealing as a quirky, fun, and engaging service for urban gentrifiers in exactly the same way that the gig economy imagines its workers as a hip and cool subset of resourceful, self-starting, and upwardly mobile youngsters. As I will demonstrate, such recategorization leverages the language of hip hop culture in order to make gig work look desirable while simultaneously suppressing the social and economic realities of the cultures it exploits. To reclass gig work as both cool and low paying requires the gig economy to strike a delicate balance. While it must ensure above all else that its contract workers remain low paid and disposable, it must simultaneously burnish its reputation as revolutionary and forward thinking. The necessity to appear both cool and cost effective is not simply some abstract neoliberal dictum dutifully followed by the gig economy and its principal stakeholders. Rather, the long-term fiscal viability of companies like Uber, Lyft, and TaskRabbit hinges most crucially on projecting an image of profitability and entrepreneurial vision to its investors. So far, however, nearly all gig companies continue to be either revenue neutral or massively in debt. Thus, to keep attracting luxurious amounts of venture capital for what remains a profitless industry, the gig economy must continually convey the image of its revolutionary potential, all the while economizing on its actual operating costs. In other words, it must keep its labor cheap and its image expensive. This dual mandate is precisely why labor is reimagined by the gig, ah, I can't keep saying gig, it's just like choking up, sorry. <laughs> the gig economy as a bohemian and cool lifestyle, liberated from the humdrum existence of the nine to five world and full of creative self-starters who march to the beat of their own drummer. <coughs> Slide one, uh, we see here uh, a bus ad by the labor platform Fiverr, which perfectly sums up the gig economy's ethos proclaiming, quote, nothing like a safe, reliable paycheck to crush your soul. I'm still, the verdict is still out whether it really crushes your soul. I, would, I wouldn't know myself because you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm part of the gig economy's entire social milieu, right? Of course, the very real precarity and insecurity implied by Fiverr's statement is completely elided. 
the reality of low pay, dangerous work conditions, and social alienation is nowhere to be found in the bright and optimistic ad campaigns that now pepper much of the urban landscape. Far from the freewheeling existence celebrated by its marketing material, gig workers are more likely to feel overburdened and exhausted from the cycle of short-term contracts, unpredictable schedules, and unsteady paychecks that dominate their lives. While flexibilization and precarity have always been inimical to service work, the gig economy has radically altered its composition by reconstructing it along the axis of logistical rationality. As I argue, the computational and communicative technologies developed by logistical science, once used to administer the circulation of commodities in the supply chain, has now been extended to intervene in the circulation of service labor. This logisticization of service labor is most acutely reflected by the rise of labor arbitrage platforms. Pioneered by Amazon's Mechanical Turk, an online platform that solicits microwork from coders and programmers, platform labor has now expanded to include many parts of the service sector, from personal transport to laundry pickup. Common to all platform-driven gig labor is its emphasis on time criticality. While efficient time management has always been critical to any service industry, the access by which it is measured by online platforms is qualitatively different than previous labor markets. Unlike brick and mortar service businesses, platforms primarily contract their services from customers' mobile devices. For this reason, productivity is not only a question of ensuring a steady stream of labor, but supplying it at a precise time and place. On-demand service labor, in other words, is punctuated by a series of critical moments. The horizon of labor time stretches only as far as the immediate demand require, required within a specific geolocation. So, you know, the paradigmatic example would be arranging to pick up uh, an Uber, right? So you have to be at a certain place at a certain time. The Uber coordinates with you to find you and you go in the Uber, so on and so forth. This is what ultimately connects the logistical rationality of both platform labor and the global supply chain. Like the just-in-time production of supply chain capitalism, Platforms require the logistical precision of what legal scholar Valerio de Stefano has referred to as, quote, the just-in-time workforce. In both cases, demand is satisfied by a never-ending circulation of capital that is distributed across a vast network of discrete locations. In this newly emerging labor market, digital platforms are the just-in-time workforce's primary material architects. Platforms set the ground rules for how the just-in-time workforce functions by designing the interfaces and code which determine the processes by which their labor is distributed and contracted out. Of all the platforms responsible for constructing the just-in-time workforce, perhaps no other epitomizes this tendency more than the ride-hailing app Uber. Since its founding in 2009, Uber has quickly grown to become the most dominant rideshare app in the US and Europe. As of May 2017, Uber controls 77% of the United States rideshare market. I haven't looked up the recent figures. I I assume it's somewhere around that still, but anyone who knows specifically, please let me know. <laughs> um, while its dominance has declined in tandem with its many public controversies, Uber nonetheless remains the paradigmatic platform of today's on-demand service economy. For instance, consider the many startups marketed as, quote, the Uber of grocery delivery or the Uber of lawn care or the Uber of laundry. Uh, these are Insta Instacart, Green Pal, and Drive with a Y for some reason with a Y, um, respectively, each one I just mentioned. As a technical design model and a cultural trope, the rise of so-called Uberization suggests that its impact extends far beyond its challenge to the traditional taxi industry. Rather, Uber has imprinted itself on the cultural imagination of the app-driven economy writ large. Uber's cultural and economic power means it faces little to no competition from other rideshare apps. As one of the only games in town, drivers are given no choice but to assent to Uber's suboptimal sub contractual terms. Overall, the vast majority of Uber's regular drivers face meager pay and highly precarious working conditions. A recent report found that median wages for Uber drivers were around $8.55 per hour, slightly below many states' minimum wage laws. Such a figure uh, should hardly surprise us, as Uber has aggressively lobbied municipalities all over the world to undercut legal protections for its drivers. Uber has ensured that its drivers remain classified as contractors to preempt enforcement of any le legal obligations that would undoubtedly expand if their, quote, driver partners, as they like to call them, were reclassified as just regular taxi drivers. But how does Uber's cutthroat maneuvers and exploitative practices affect its public image, and perhaps more importantly, its ability to continue soliciting venture capital? 
While it has faced scrutiny for its legally questionable machinations, uh, more recently its former CEO Travis Kalanick's boorish behavior, which I'm sure we are all familiar with in some way or another. Um, despite that, the brutal reality of Uber's low pay and unsafe working conditions remains overshadowed by the exuberant attitude it continues to receive from investors and the mainstream press. Perhaps it is because, not wanting to risk their investment, the financial class has as much interest in concealing Uber's labor policies as the company itself. But beyond simply covering up or distracting the public from the reality of its business practices, Uber has also attempted to assuage public scrutiny by converting the reality of its meager pay into a hip and cool way of earning extra money on the side. Uh, for instance, here we see a screenshot from its recent advertising campaign to recruit new drivers. The commercial profiles a supposedly typical driver who zips from her Uber shift to her stint as a personal trainer to finally relaxing in a tub after a satisfying day of gig work. <laughs> as we can see, she's very happy with her, with her life here. Um, here, the cultural uh, expectation engendered by Uber is one where gigging is fun, attractive, and profitable all at the same time. Uber thus deploys an ideological strategy to convert the vagaries of precarity and short-term work into positive and rewarding qualities. Furthermore, the commercial's verbal and visual language shows how Uber rather awkwardly attempts to adopt the vernacular of black urban cool to rebrand itself as a casual and fun form of part-time work. Viewers are instructed to, quote, get their side hustle on, which I don't know if you guys can see the caption here, but she says, these days, anyone can have a side hustle, apparently. So. This dubiously racialized discourse communicates to potential drivers that Uber is a hip way to earn extra money. Blackness and hipness are synonymized with one another, creating both a commodified and essentialized depiction of black American culture. Along with commodifying black American culture, the commercial also foregrounds domestic femininity, as we see in the, second, uh, in the screenshot on the right with her in the, in the bathtub. Perhaps it is deployed to soften the company's macho image, whose public controversies surrounding the treatment of its female employees has led many to condemn its corporate culture as hostile to women. But I argue it also points to the historical relation between feminization and service labor, wherein women are consigned to unpaid and underpaid forms of care labor, reproductive labor, and other low-wage work. For Uber, the feminized form of uh, address we see in its advertising content engenders an expectation of gig work, not only as lower paying than traditionally masculinized labor, but one that necessitates a sensitivity and emotional intelligence that is uh, apparently uniquely suited to women's work. Most importantly, Uber's advertising strategy demonstrates that its growth strategies are not only executed litigiously through back-channel deals and aggressive lobbying campaigns, it also brandishes cultural tropes, many of which employ racist and sexist stereotypes, to market itself to the public as an attractive way to earn money in between doing what you're passionate about or aspiring to become. Uber's flimsy attempts to remediate its controversial image in the public sphere exemplifies the limits to which the gig, uh, gig economy can simply re-engineer the socius in order to execute its mandates of maximal, maximal efficiency, flexibility, and economization. Beyond transforming the jurisdictional, economic, and technical composition of labor, the gig economy requires more diffuse forms of hegemonic power, such as social legitimacy, local authority, and cultural influence. In other words, to become an economic dominant, it must also solidify itself as a cultural dominant, a move that necessitates more than just technical and legal challenges to the labor market. It must intervene at the level of language to affix a long-term cultural expectation of precarious and flexible work as the new social norm. By incorporating the symbolic economy of black urban culture into the world of platform-driven service labor, the gig economy constructs an image of a hip and young workforce but one that does away with the attendant social realities of black urban experience, and for that matter, the black working class altogether. The only reality purposely left in place by the gig economy is the expectation of low pay, irregular hours, and lax regulation. Unsurprisingly, the precarious nature of gig labor is deliberately underemphasized by its main arbiters, and as I've shown, even recoded as both a virtue and a profitable form of self-branding. Ultimately, Uber's ideal typical image of a freewheeling urban gig worker is perfectly embodied by the character of the guy in high maintenance. Combining emotional sensitivity, hipness, and improvisational resourcefulness, the guy embodies the gig economy's project to, to remake work into a precarious and deracinated form of urban social reproduction.
Hello? What I'm going to present today is part of a collective research project called Into the Black Box, composed by transdisciplinary Italian young scholars now working in Bologna, Lugano, Paris, and Barcelona. Our main focus has been logistics in the last year, using it in a wider sense. And I just show this to give you an idea about what I mean by uh, why a wide sense last uh, year, uh, last sorry <laughs> week I was uh, in New Orleans for another conference and uh, on Sunday I was just walking around and I saw this. You know, it's a cargo <laughs> ship and I send it to, to one friend in Italy saying, oh, uh, see, I'm in New Orleans, and he said, what the fuck is wrong with you? You are in New Orleans, and you send this kind of things to me. <laughs> then I send this video, no, it's okay, just, and then I send it to my colleagues, and they say, oh, nice, wonderful, so <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's what we call container porn, and it's like, you know, getting crazy with containers. So these uh, containers are like the traditional, um, I mean, logistics uh, symbol, and we are trying to enlarge the conception of logistics as I'm going to show you. So I start with a little boring part that is theoretical and um, just some insights. So this quote is from Marx Grundrisse. The nature of capital presupposes that it travels through the different phases of circulation, not as it does in the mind, where one concept turns into the next at the speed of thought in no time, but rather rather a situation which are separate in time. It must spend sometimes as a crystallis before it can take off as a butterfly. Exactly two centuries after Karl, Mar Karl Marx's date of born, before flying like a butterfly, contemporary financialized capital still needs to pass through its crystallis phase. This peculiar stage is the domain of logistics, whose vast ocean of operations has a worldwide extension and an unprecedented speed. Logistics is the strategic intelligence that coordinates the harmonizing of production, circulation, and consumption of global capitalism, where an increasingly accelerated high-speed circulation is gaining hegemony over the whole process. The geographical fantasy of logistics conceives the world as a system of continuous flows which are always in motion. A cartography of flux is conducted through a complex network of logistical infrastructures, the supply chain capitalism described by Anna Tsing. The so-called 4.0 turn and the implementation of logistical systems within cities are the new frontiers of contemporary logistics. Our research is an investigation about how these global supply chains hit the ground, adopting new northern Italy's last 10 years as our main uh, case study. Secondly, we aim to show the profound ambivalence of these processes, which, rather than being unidirectional as they pretend to be, are always contested, delineating a complex field of tensions and conflict. Finally, I must say that my speech today discusses only preliminary results and draft hypotheses. So, the, um, no, the first, um, sorry. The first point is the necessity to endow the analysis of logistics with a genealogical background, to empower a critical reflection on it and to avoid the risk of being trapped within logistics' own narratives, that is, seeing logistics as something completely new and without history. Even if many studies point to the military transformation of the main, as the main historical matrix of contemporary logistical rationality, we think that an alternative geneal genealogical lens through which logistics development has to be understood is provided by Stefano Arne and Fred Moten, who yesterday mm, made this, uh, this point, uh, so I quote from his quote, modern logistics was born that way. Modern logistics is founded with the first great movement of commodities, the ones that could speak. It was founded in the Atlantic slave trade, founded against the Atlantic slave. 
Throughout modernity, logistics has been the art, the technique, and the science of mobilizing commodities, armies, and subjects. However, the so-called logistics revolution during the 50s, uh, 50s and 60s of the 20th century, if we follow uh, Morton's argument, could be reframed as a counter-revolution, considering the role um, that it played um, in dismantling the social power accumulated by the first working class within the factories. If this hypothesis makes sense, we could say that contemporary logistics was founded, recalling Arne's and, uh, Arne and Morton's quote, against the furthest working class. A logistical gaze could be a new and powerful tool thanks to which we could productively, productively read the transformations of urban and urban textures and labor at the beginning of the 21st century in terms of urban borders and fluxes, urban subjects and forms of production. Last point of this boring part. Uh, logistics um, has to be conceived as a logic, a matrix of rationality aiming to flatten the space to foster, foster circulation without interruptions. Logistics is an ideology of a smooth space of fluxes. But the current emphasis on logistics pervading many managerial discourses is also a symptom of crisis, as Giovanni Righi has shown in his historical reading of the world system theory cycles of accumulation. To make it simple, when a system of production goes into crisis, as it was during the 60s and the early 70s of the 20th century, it historically moves his balance from production to logistics and finance to survive. We still are within this scenario, which, I repeat, is a symptom of a systemic crisis. Therefore, my point is that platforms such as Amazon, food delivery platforms, Uber and the like, which I'm going to concentrate on today, are emblematic of this crisis and are shaped, shaped around a twofold rationality. On one hand, the just-in-time and to-the-point logic of development, aiming at removing any obstacles to commodities and both circulation within urban spaces, but on the other end, they represent a desperate need of contemporary capitalism to sell things, making economy working and extracting value. Given the theoretical background, the aim of the research group I am part of is to merge labor transformations, urban changing, and their mutual connection via the digitalization in 4.0 industries, using logistics as the lens to analyze them. The hypothesis is that this mobile interpretive machine is a productive prism through which it is possible to analyze the ongoing transformations and to develop new political imaginaries and tools for action. More precisely, uh, we, are work, uh, we have worked on the Italian case of the last 10 years, adopting a method of inquiry based on uh, twofold and complementary entry points, looking in conjunction at what can be called the frontiers of development and the tensions, the struggles and conflicts arising within them. We are developing a, a synchronic and processual comparison between three case studies in northern Italy. So one, the long process of conflictual organization within its logistics is traditional logistics sector, second, the territorializing of, uh, territorialization of Amazon, and third, the recent implementation of food delivery platforms. And today I will focus mainly on Bologna. So I'm going to give you just very brief insights on them. During the last decade, an intense process of, of workers' organization in northern Italy logistics sector has shed light on the new territorial configuration of, the, of that region. This sequence of strikes and blockages show the dense network of infrastructures, streets, warehouses, railroads, ra railways, and so forth, dedicated to commodity transportation, an invisible map sustaining the circulation, distribution, and consumption for every city. As you can see from this uh, map, uh, showing uh, where the main logistic warehouse strikes took place in Bologna, they are all out of the city center and quite randomly dislocated in the metropolitan area. This way to organize the distribution uh, and uh, its infrastructural apparatus lead us to concentrate on what we labeled as the Padanian megalopolis, the northern Italy danced, uh, densely urbanized area, as a territorial framework of analysis. This map shows how in the last 40 years logistics has contributed to the spread out of the historical cities. These struggles uh, led us to start reflecting upon the deep intertwining between logistics and urban textures, understanding how circulation is at the very heart of contemporary urban planning and development. Anyway, 
The Italian logistics sector has been based on a low-tech industry and a rationalized labor force, and it grown on rates of almost 5% per year from 2005 until 2015. Moreover, these struggles has been part of a global dynamics of turbulence within the logistics sector, as the recent book has wonderfully collected shock points. The, uh, the workers use the social media to spread the news about their struggle, but the informal communication channels of the migrant communities were definitely more important. And it is remarkable to say that a, a crucial subjective element of, for the struggles uh, was what we call as the wind of the so-called Arab Springs that traveled through the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. However, something is changing as a response to this uh, process of conflictual organization. Amazon arrived only in the last four years in the most important Italian cities, but its business is increasing very fast. Amazon is uh, uh, implementing its own infrastructures and given the turbulences in the logistics sector, we state that Amazon is developing a specific urban intelligence to avoid disruptions. Its search for new labor pools and the mobility of its infrastructures, just-in-time urbanism, is delineating a new frontier of labor and territorial organization in the Padania Megalopolis logistics sector. While well, since a few years ago most of the logistics companies and their warehouses uh, fa um, were far away from the city's core, with innovations like Amazon, logistics companies are developing a new set of infrastructures and organizational procedures to adapt themselves to new, this new way of the business. In fact, Amazon is emblematic. From an internet company to a logistics company, it is developing a new intelligence of the urban, articulating its infrastructures in the whole metropolitan territory. If the Italian logistics sector used to be quite fragmented in terms of business models and companies, and as I said, based on a weak technological investment and a low-skilled labor force, Amazon retail model is increasingly causing new standards and procedures for the whole logistics sectors, and a new ma territorial map is emerging, connecting huge apps at the, um, as the traditional logistical warehouse to subcontracted warehouses to small proximity distribution points at city's cores within a new supply chain logic. The process of territorialization of Amazon, however, is not a smooth process. The employment of young Italian labor force and investment in technology, in technology has its ambivalences. And a recent strike on the Black Friday showed this emblematically. However, Amazon's well-known automatized and mediatized way of labor organizing within its warehouses has become a model for the very recent implementation of the food delivery platforms, meaning the most extreme frontier of contemporary just-in-time-to-the-point logistical logic. So Just Eat, Deliveroo, Foodor, and Uber Eats, and the like, are platforms that are still uh, virtual infrastructures, and they started their, their business in some of the main Italian cities only in the last two years, generalizing and applying Amazon model um, over the whole metropolitan tissue, seeing the city cities like a huge automatized logistical warehouse. The door-to-door -door distribution of food, uh, we can uh, call it ironically the Italia Tele Bolognese 2.0, is a sort of forefront, in the Italian case, of the logistics logic, opening up the market to all other sorts of commodities distribution. This is what we are calling the new metropolitan logistics, based on a concrete fantasy of moving everything with a click. We are doing a collective uh, inquiry in Turin, Bologna, and Milan on the new working conditions within food delivery platforms. Organized by, uh, by an algorithm connected uh, via GPS, uh, their work is set via WhatsApp, and the workers move around this, the city as Google Maps. Um, these ordinary tools are becoming logistical media that calibrate labor and life, objects and atmospheres, becoming a, deter a determined force in the production of subjectivity and economy. Workers of this economic branch are called riders, and they are quite emblematic of the contradictory development of uh, platform capitalism. High-tech ways of work organization are intimately linked with archaic logics. Above all, they are piece work workers paid for the delivery they do, rather than for the hours they effectively work. Food delivery platform, platform business is almost concentrated within city center, and they often do not have any physical infrastructure apart from small recruitment offices. The job pretend to be 
uh, smart and cool, and uh, I um, report two quite curious quotes from the WhatsApp group of Just Eat in Bologna. These are, uh, these are messages sent by the so-called dispatcher, a sort of uh, group manager who, are, who was working in France at that moment. Uh, so th he sent these messages at the beginning of the work shift. Hello everybody, I hope you are ready tonight. Turn on the engineers, raise the shields of dark matter and something like that. So, sign your French Jedi Master. Or, hi Moonbrush and Tigers, you are a lot tonight, so we do not fear about the dangers of the jungle, and armed with our crises, we will defeat the taxi evil population of the Malaysia. So just to give you an idea about how is the environment of that kind of work. However, and again, uh, this really recent stream of platform business is being hardly contested by the workers. Spontaneous strikes are going, on, are going on since the last year and a half, confirming the unstable and striated nature of logistical processes, even in their fresh configuration platform digitalized ways, and attempts to worker organization arising. So, to resume, and using some quotes from Kalum, both algorithm, algorithm management and logistics engineering, um, more and more pervasive in productive processes, design smooth urban space of never-ending flows. Their dream is to prevent any disruption. Data and commodities are expected to move smartly and resiliently under formalized and computed performances. The human factor seems to have no place in the organization of labor process. Platforms combining digitalization with a supply chain organization are contributing to change working condition and to renew labor relationship. Nevertheless, this is not a one direction process. In many cases, platforms are also generating social and or labor movements engaged in the consequences of such transformations. The recent wave of curious protests is not all Italian, but rather it erupted all around Europe, bringing back the subjective role of labor force that can express requests and needs not scheduled by the platform. However, the significance of food delivery platforms doesn't come from the proportion of the working class that work for them or from the existence of mass workplaces, nor does their significance come from a strategically important location within capitalist production. A food delivery platform is not a cool mine or a port, of course. Instead, the significance of these platforms can be found in their relative position within capitalist development. The most advanced nodes uh, of the network of capital are those which are attempting, successfully or not, to dramatically recompose production in order to gain a competitive advantage and, si and sidestep the results of the working class organization. Food delivery platforms are one of these nodes in this frontier of development. Moreover, platform seems to rest both on urban dimension uh, and digitalization of labor. City is the physical space crossed by information and communication technologies. Algorithms mm, manage a supply chain that connect different points of the city thanks to riders' work. Urban logistics is exactly this new digital organization of city life around a continuous flow of production, circulation, consumption. And I found really intriguing a slogan uh, by par Paris riders that say le rue et notre usine, that means the street is our factory, to mean how production became diffused through urban physical spaces and human relations. So starting from these case studies, uh, the proposal of this contribution has been uh, to discuss uh, the trajectory from a low-tech and traditional sector of logistics to its newly transformations in response to struggles, so Amazon and then food delivery platforms, showing how the logistical logics and the global and platform companies are performing and generating frictions and responses in the labor force and in the urban development. Of course, the traditional logistics Amazon and the food delivery platforms do not delineate a progressive substitution, but rather a complex integration and assemblage. So, to conclude, the emergent trends in labor organization and conflicts, urban planning and logistical capitalism <coughs> consent to point on the new uh, metropolitan logistics as one of the crucial vector and frontier of, all, of what we are calling uh, platform urbanism. Therefore, emergent trends in urban transformations should be understood uh, as the complex and unstable result of the intertwining between the urban intelligence of logistics platform 
and the continuous frictions and resistances they found on the ground. The layer of, of platform urbanism pushing towards the flexibilization of the urban tissues and the becoming hub of the cities is parallel to the flexibilization of working conditions. However, at the same time, the digital is a field of conflict and counter-organization. Therefore, platform urbanism is a contested process and, it, it must be said, it is not still clear, clear if it is designing our immediate future or, on the contrary, it is going to be a new urban babble. Thank you. No, we, we made a change. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Silva Lindner. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Information at the University of Michigan, also affiliated with the Science and Technology Studies program there and Center for Chinese Studies. I'm super excited to be here today and thank so much to the organizers for making this all happen. This has been a fantastic event so far and I look forward uh, to the conversations that will continue today. So I will be talking about the pleasures of hacking at scale. I'm drawing here from long-term ethnographic research that I've been conducting in China over the last seven years. Um, and I'm also working on a book that's related to this topic. So I, this is a small, tiny subset, of course, you know, but I would love any feedback or conversations you know, that come out of this later today. Um, so I'll start with this. In uh, a 2015 Kickstarter campaign, the open source hardware producer Seed Studio promoted one of its latest products as follows. What if we designed a phone to be anything we want it to be? For the last eight years in Shenzhen, Seed Studio has been, hack has been busy hacking the electronic supply chain to make advanced tools and technologies available to everyone. The result is the ReFone. This crowdfunding campaign for the so-called ReFone, a do-it-yourself mobile phone kit, summarized neatly the ambitions that had brought together a loose collective of open source hardware and maker advocates active in China since around 2007. Their proposition was that the city of Shenzhen in the south of China with its history of being a special economic zone and continuous infrastructures of industrial production constituted an ideal laboratory to scale open source hardware tinkering and making from prototyping into mass production. So while open source hardware platforms like the Arduino promise to enable people without a professional engineering degree, so people like artists and designers for instance or scholars like us, to open up the black box of everyday electronics and end consumer devices. In contrast, an engagement with the city of Shenzhen, they argued, promised to teach about the inner workings of global trade, supply chain networks, and mass production. It promised to open up the black box of economies of scale. It was this idea to scale one of the key promises of the maker movement to hack capitalism that the China, China's maker advocates were undertaking. And this is reflected here, so this ideal to hack capitalism um, in Chris Anderson's 2012 book on makers, the next industrial revolution, where he says, the ability to manufacture local or global at will is a huge advantage. The simple menu option of a 3D printer, so open source hardware tools and machines, compresses three centuries of industrial revolution into a single mouse click. If Karl Marx were here today, his jaw would be on the floor. Talk about controlling the tools of production. You, you can now set factories into motion with a mouse click. And you will, of course, recognize the kind of neoliberal underpinning here of uh, this appropriation of, of, of Marx. Um, so this idea to scale this promise to hack capitalism um, had started out in a very small business. So Seed Studio, with which I began this talk, 
um, was a two-people business that quickly um, made a name for itself in especially American and European maker networks. And by 2012, the, company, the company's own promise to scale the sort of hacking of capitalism um, had allowed the company to grow. Um, so it, it had by within only four years, you know, a 95% market share um, of the sort of maker open source hardware industry with most of, of its um, products being actually sold in America and in Europe. And it itself had managed to scale. So it, it's turned into um, a, a, a business of like over 100 employees with roughly 15 million US dollars revenue at that time. So over the years that followed, a growing number of seed studios um, maker clients, especially those coming from America and Europe, would travel to Shenzhen to experiment how to hack it scale themselves. Seed Studio offered free factory tours for them and organized visits to the city's electronic markets of Huaqiang Bay, as you can see here depicted on the screen. It produced maps that scaled down the vast landscape of industrial production and hosted maker fairs and other events to demonstrate how one hacked global supply chains in practice. Hacking here meant to tinker at and with scales from microelectronics and markets to cities, economies, and global relations. Soon, a series of foreign, largely Western financial and educational exchange programs began investing in this promise of hacking capitalism at scale. In a 2014 TED talk, Choi Yi, to head of the MIT Media Lab, described his somewhat astonished impressions of Shenzhen after a visit with his students. What was happening in Shenzhen, he said, they were not just making PowerPoints or prototypes, they were fiddling with the manufacturing equipment and innovating right there on the factory floor, so speed, right? This, the kids in Shenzhen make new cell phones like kids in Palo Alto make websites. So there's a rainforest of innovation going on. What you thought you could only do with software, they're doing with hardware. And similarly, Shenzhen became known um, both in European and American networks of digital tech produc production as a Hollywood for makers, touted by prominent Western media outlets such as Wired, The Economist, and Forbes as the Silicon Valley for hardware. And this is a screenshot of a movie, of a documentary that Wired UK released on this topic of Shenzhen as the Silicon Valley of hardware. But how did this happen? How did it happen that within only a couple of years, the Western imaginary of the city of Shenzhen had changed from a region of industrial access and low quality production into a laboratory of future making? So in the rest of this talk, um, my goal is to show you how um, a techno-optimism typically associated with Silicon Valley or cities like New York or histories of Western internet counterculture was displaced onto Shenzhen exactly because the region was seen as not having fully arrived in modernity, because it was seen as simultaneously pre-capitalist and capitalist symbolizing both the West's past and its potential recuperation. I'll also show that this promise to scale open source hardware in, in Shenzhen enabled certain people, many of whom were men, to sustain masculine pleasures of hacking machines by attaching them to the hacking of markets and supply chains. And so my approach here really aligns uh, with a feminist tradition coming out of the anthropology of the global, specifically focusing um, on research in Asia, like the work of Anna Tsing, Nancy Jan, and Lisa Roffel, for instance, that calls for noticing the gaps and fissures of technological promise. And so throughout, you know, I will sort of unpack the gaps and the sort of promise of hacking capitalism um, as it was displaced onto Shenzhen. <coughs> so in April 2013, Bonnie Huang, uh, a graduate from the engineering program at MIT and a prominent Chinese-American hacker, published a blog post um, which described a simple pocket-sized phone he acquired in a, in a mall at the Shenzhen Huaqiang Bay Electronic Markets for $12. How was it possible, Huang pondered in the post, to produce a functioning phone at such a low price? A key component of the phone, Huang discovered, was a chip from the Taiwanese, contract, uh, from the Taiwanese company MediaTek, a chip manufacturer, which had been key to the rapid expansion of an informal electronics production culture in the years of 2006 to 2008, often referred to as Shanzhai in Chinese. So Shanghai, some of you might have come across this term as it's been covered widely also um, in, in media and by scholars alike. It figures as a transnational imaginary of grassroots ingenuity and clever countercultural counter survival tactic attached to mundane acts of copycat and piracy. 
So Shanshai translates into English as, for example, mountain village or bandit fortress, and is commonly understood as referring to various outlawed but communal forms of self-preservation and self-protection that strove for local autonomy during difficult times throughout Chinese history, as, as Denise Ho summarized it so well. Lynn Jeffrey from the Institute of the Future in San Francisco describes it as, quote, a clever survival tactics and an anti-authoritarian attitude that has, not unlike Robin Hood, an element of criminality by resisting to and or stealing from the establishment, mostly in order to serve those excluded from systems of privilege. And in a similar, similar way, Ned Rossiter proposes Shanjai as an example of post-population and non-governable subjects external to the logistics of media coordination, capture, and control. So, Zhangjai had broad allure, both amongst academics, people uh, who were commenting on the tech industry, but also by open source hardware hackers who made their way to Shenzhen. And so while the term is often taken to be a shorthand for the broader cultural phenomenon of Chinese copycat and China's broader disregard of Western legal structures, Shenzhen itself as a city and as a region has come to be understood as the place where Shanghai had thrived due to the region's history as a special economic zone and the local, regional, and global flows of people, finance, and technology the special economic zone had enabled. And we already heard about zones and economic zones uh, yesterday really nicely, so I think this ties back to our conversations from Dara yesterday. So the Shanghai phone, for example, and there are some of them depicted here, refers, so this is a, a term that came up and it was used by people, Shanghai T in Chinese, or the Shanghai phone, refers to the variety of mobile phones designed and manufactured in Shenzhen that began flooding both national and international markets since around 2004 and five. They included small batch production of niche products, such as the dual SIM card phone for migrant workers um, who travel across borders, phones in unique shapes and sizes designed for both low income populations and elite customers. The most controversial version of the Shanghai phone, even though it's constituting the industry's actually smallest market share are copycat iPhones, and this is a more humorous version of something like that, that were released as low budget versions. So often with features that target again niche markets in China and that were often released before the actual iPhone came on the market in the United States. So the Shanghai phone became an object of interest that appeared elusive and yet made Shanghai as a phenomenon easier to grab. The sheer variety and speed of production was made palpable through the flurry of phones. The proliferation to markets around the globe, like Africa, fueled nationalistic sentiments of China's expanding economic and political power. At the same time, Shanghai and its associations with infringement of international copyright and IP regulations appeared to confirm that China was far from becoming a legitimate player in global innovation and knowledge production networks. As Shanghai surfaced across national discourse and the worlds of Western academia and electronics hacking alike, it was taken to be symbolic of a countercultural spirit that united various regions at the so-called tech periphery, um, so for example, the global south or rural um, America, to counter Western or other forms of hegemony. Shanghai was symbolic of China's renewed ability to turn a history of Western colonization capitalist exploitation and hegemony on its head. It was so intriguing to Western technologists and academics alike exactly because it represented a gap, a fissure, in the seemingly all-encompassing modernist legacy of the West. So Shanghai began being taken up by other entities. In 2011, the Shanghai Office of the American Design Consultancy, IDEO, released a guidebook on, quote, designing for Shanghai that suggests Shanghai slash copycat design represents a vast business opportunity. Shanghai is an open platform for grassroots innovation. Shanghai designs are an opportunity for international companies to introduce Chinese consumers to their brands and then observe how local Chinese culture adapts their offerings. So Shanghai here in this case is presented as providing, not without some irony, a unique platform for foreign corporations to learn how to adapt to the Chinese market, so a business opportunity, right? and more broadly um, to target Chinese consumers. IDEO itself at that time allegedly was struggling to enter the Chinese market, and so Shanghai here functions as a way to turn around IDEO's own consulting business in Asia. So IDEO becomes the bridge between Western corporations and Shanghai by way of translating the latter into a business advantage for the former. The Chinese um, 
the rhetoric of alarm and urgency to act pervades a lot of these stories. So uh, this is um, from um, materials released by the consultancy Booth and, and company, and they say here, the Chinese mentality of fearless experimentation has allowed, and by which they again refer to Shanghai, has allowed Chinese companies to gain advantage over slower moving foreign competitors, right? So the key advantage of Shanghai was speed. The company recommends that foreign companies get out of, get out of your comfort zone, learn from the Shanghai players, become fearless experimenters. So learn from the Shanghai players and to become fearless experimenters promised a way for the designer engineer, especially in Western offices, to self-transform in order to contend with and intervene into the pitfalls of modern technological progress. This meant making fearless experimentation and speed central to one's own practice and professional identity. So a lot of this, what we've seen so far, the sort of allure of Shenzhen and Shanghai in Western worlds of technology design and research is deeply entangled, I argue, with a sentiment of rising precarity that has proliferated, especially in the United States and Europe, since 2007 and 8, the financial crisis. In the years that followed, long-held ideas of modern progress and techno-optimism, or the promises of technological progress, were more publicly challenged. An increasing number of news media coverage, for example, warned about the cost of ruthless neoliberal capitalism, such as the proliferation of precarious conditions of work that affected many classes and occupations across the globe. These writings signals the dilemma of a tech industry that found itself conf confronted with a growing suspicion that the values it had propagated since the 1990s, the countercultural ideal of like tearing down hierarchies and in the hierarchy's place, uh, create a peer-to-peer -peer and collaborative society, as historian Fred Turner has so nicely observed it, were far from being implemented. On the contrary, short-term contract labor and the creative industry, often without pension and health insurance, alongside the spread of labor exploitation via social media platforms, as we just heard, like Uber and Amazon Mechanical Turk, rendered these earlier visions naive at best and harmful at worst. So in this very moment, an engagement with Shanghai promised to experiment with alternatives to this kind of precarity that, as Angela McRoby shows, has become inherent to creative work in the tech industries and to build alternative subject positions that regained a sense of control and actionability. So at the same time, of course, and many of us are familiar with this, universities had become increasingly under attack for failing to prepare the next generation of workers for the so-called economic realities and the world out there. Incubators, hackathons, startup weekends, and similar retraining programs were positioned as promising alternatives that would enable the next generation not only to find jobs, but to make their own. As Brie Pettis, for instance, the CEO of the New York City-based 3D printing firm Makerbot, uh, put it in 2015, making today is two clicks away from becoming an entrepreneur um, it's about taking the steps from self-reliance to self-employment. But incubators paled, many argued, in comparison to what Shenzhen had to offer, Shenzhen speed. This was expressed in often repeated phrases, such as, um, in China, speed is sudu, very fast speed is Shenzhen sudu, or what takes weeks in the US takes a day in Shenzhen. Borrowing from a very powerful neoliberal uh, rhetoric and internalization of the speed of Shanghai's electronic markets was rendered inevitable. And this is, for example, how one of the investors um, who is currently active in Shenzhen put it, this is just the way the world is going at the moment. People have to create their jobs. So sort of a rhetoric of inevitability. The notion of Shenzhen speed itself was coined during the economic opening reforms in the 1980s when Deng Xiaoping declared Shenzhen a special economic zone and by extension, a laboratory for China's experimentation with capitalism. So Shenzhen speed referred to the testing out of how far you could wake, walk away from the values of socialism that had, that had until just recently governed China's people. At first, the government had deliberately allowed experimentation with both economic and political liberalization to induce desires for self-transformation. But Tiananmen in 1989, firmly established that while China's political leadership granted economic agency, it tightly controlled its political arena. Shenzhen's speed came to stand in for a neoliberal governance that downplayed economic inequality and capitalist exploitation through a rhetoric of individuals being empowered to become economic actors and self-transform from socialist actors, right? Um, 
Fast forward to the years of 2008 and 2010, the rise of the maker movement, as I was just outlining it, Jean Genet not only survived, but appeared to thrive amidst the uptake of a neoliberal technique of governance in China that treat, as historian Michelle Murphy put it so eloquently, life on economic terms, that is life rendered as sacrificable to the economy and as disposable when it hinders or is invaluable to economic growth and stability. To many of the European and American academics, designers and engineers I met over the years, Shenzhen appeared to be the ultimate place of incubation to adapt to and regain control over capitalist processes lost in the age of rising precarity and ne neoliberalism. Shenzhen stood for self-reliance, resourcefulness, and clever forms of micro-resistance that were not of a political nature, but followed an economic aesthetic, utopia made possible through economic self-refashioning. Shenzhen showcased a form of resilience amidst, amidst bureaucratic structures, political, political control, and capitalist expansion. It granted them a transfer of pleasure, the pleasure derived from hacking machines to a pleasure now derived from hacking markets. And this is what I will show for the last bits of this talk. Key to this translation of hacking machines to hacking markets were incubator and accelerator programs like the Shenzhen-based accelerator funded by the Irish venture capital firm SOS Ventures, and you can see their flyers here on the screen. In 2013, I spent a year conducting ethnographic research with the 13 startups that had been accepted to this program. On the opening day, the program director described the purpose of being in Shenzhen as follows. You have people here in China that bring it down to business and make it happen. So this is about what's really happening in Shenzhen today. So we are really going boldly where no one has gone before. I'm sure some of you re uh, recognize the reference here, the seemingly casual uh, reference to the pop science fiction series Star Trek, of course, is not to underestimate. As a narrative of American frontierism, exploration, and boldly going, Star Trek portrays space as the final frontier and technology as a tool placed in the hand of individuals who are accorded the freedom to wield it. References to Star Trek created an imaginary connection between Shenzhen and the tropes of boldly going and space exploration. It legitimized an engagement with Shenzhen based on masculine and colonial narratives of adventure, exploration, and technology technological mastery. If the space was the final frontier to be mastered by individuals empowered by the latest technological advances, China, and specifically Shenzhen, was the untamed land of hardware innovation of Shanghai to be mastered by the startup and the tech entrepreneur. The, acceler the accelerator kept alive, in other words, what historian Paul Edwards has called a micro world. Quote, members of many computer subcultures, hackers, networking enthusiasts, video game addicts derive a deep form of pleasure from a blending of self and the machine creating a micro world that is a unique ontological um, structure that is simpler and seemingly more manageable than the world they represent. Micro worlds are appealing because they are free of unwanted complexity, Edwards writes. Within them, things make sense in a way human subject intersubjectivity cannot, and the programmer is omnipotent. It was in places like the Irish, the Irish Accelerator Program in Shenzhen that old regimes of techno-idealism and masculinity of tech production could live on, translated from a mastery over machines into a mastery over a region and its supply chains, factories, and a Chinese culture of copycat. The people who set up China's early open source hardware spaces and projects with which I began this talk share a sense of ambivalence towards such uptakes of their ideas. They often struggle to dispel Western images of China as lagging behind, copycat, and fake that continued despite the interest in Shenzhen and Shanghai. When C Studio, for instance, gained popularity in 2010, the CEO and founder Eric Pan was invited to attend the Open Source Hardware Summit here in New York City. There he found many people who knew about his company but discovered that few had recognized that it was a Chinese company, as he said. None of them believed that innovative products could come out of China or out of a Chinese company. In contrast to the European and American counterparts, China's maker advocates were seldom able to lift the promise of hacking capitalism in the same empowering way. They hoped to distance their work from Shanghai and its associations with copycat. They saw it as a key to why China was still not seen as an equal partner in design and innovation. While Western maker and open source hardware advocates and academics turned to Shenzhen and Shanghai as hopeful and promising because it evidenced the gaps of technological progress and modern capitalism, China's maker advocates attached themselves to Western principles 
of design and innovation, such as design thinking, human-centered design, and open source. This attachment to Western ideals, they thought, would provide Western legitimacy and at last grant China and its people the status of modernity. Such longing and yearning for modernity, of course, uh, that we see in Chinese makers' articulations has complicated rule, roots in colonial history and weaves throughout the socialist and post-socialist eras. Under Mao Zedong, for instance, socialism was positioned as a project of modernity that enabled China to position itself not behind, but in advance of a decaying Europe. Modernity here was to be achieved via class struggle and the transformation of the self into revolutionary subjects. And in the 1980s, during post-socialism, the Chinese government attributed China's failure to modernize to the so-called low quality of its people, used as a general explanation for everything that held the Chinese nation back from becoming truly modern and achieving its rightful place in the world that was lost during the colonial periods, also often referred to as national humiliation in China, the opium wars and European colonialism in the 19th century. Histories of colonial encounters and yearnings for modernity they induce live on in contemporary experiments in Shenzhen. They appear in the gaps and seams of open source hardware projects like the DIY phone kit with which I began this talk, aimed at dismantling the in the West pervasive image that China, despite fears over its global reach and economic power, is still in some ways lagging behind. While ideas and ideals to hack capitalism and to hack alternatives lived on and in, in Shenzhen, they did not scale equally. And with this, I would like to thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Colette and Matthew, for having me and giving me this opportunity to present what's hopefully coming to an end, but I don't think so. It's uh, my master's thesis research, which I think will just continue even after I graduate. Um, we'll see. Um, so just to kind of give a bit of an intro, um, this thesis, I've been doing research in Colón, Panama for the past year, year and a half or so, and I'm more interested in how supply chains and logistics end up shaping spaces where they end up landing and situating and grounding in a specific site. So this is research is very much about urban conflict um, and class struggle in Colón and in Panama um, in relation to um, actual supply chains and uh, kind of global supply chains. So this is just a bit of it of the lens that I've been using um, in the thesis paper, somewhat looking at how legal um, in terms of uh, uh, free trade agreements as well as economic zone laws, which ends up uh, appearing to be a very specific theme in all the talks. Um, not surprising, also management, which is logistics, infrastructure, and nature, and how these four lenses end up interacting. So as an isthmus um, bridging two large bodies of water and two enormous masses of land, Panama's geographic location has been a strategic maritime site for centuries, both commercially and militarily. The shortest distance across um, from coast to coast is approximately a one-hour drive, around 80 kilometers across. Um, the modern infrastructure today uh, looks, actually, let me go back. So the modern infrastructure today looks fairly different from the roughly paved road of El Camino Royal along the Chagres River, which facilitated the transport of gold and silver during Spanish colonial rule in the 16th century. The French were the first to pursue this vision in Panama of constructing the first interoceanic canal in the Americas, but failed in their attempt to build a sea level um, design canal, and also due to thousands of deaths of workers from yellow fever and malaria. In 1903, in an effort to take the territory after rejected proposal by Colombia, and um, around this time in the early 20th century, uh, this territory was owned by Colonia, um, Colombia, the United States conspired against the Colombian government and supported a Panamanian independence movement led by elites in a fairly bloodless uh, coup. With the signing of the Hai Bunai Treaty in 1903, a United uh, the United States was provided a 10-mile wide strip of land for the canal, which would end up shaping the space as a global, uh, a global space for the next century. And it was not until around 100 years later in 2000 that the canal was actually transferred back to Panama. 
So the city of Cologne, my case study, um, became an important port um, for American companies the decades following the construction of the canal. In the 1920s, the United Fruit Company had begun weekly shipments of bananas from the port of Cologne to New York City. Eventually, during the interwar period, Cologne had sought out to construct a free zone with its territory to attract foreign companies as an instrument for economic development. And by 1948, following the recommendations of Dr. Thomas E. Lyons, an American foreign trade specialist, the Panamanian government approved law number 18, which created the Cologne Free Zone, an autonomous institution of the Panamanian state as an area to take advantage of the city's geographic uh, position and its direct contact to international trade. Today, Cologne represents the darker side to Panama's rapid economic growth and success, on, uh, unlike Panama City, which is the nation's emblematic jewel. Surrounding the wall of the Colón Free Zone, the decaying city of Colón stands precariously cornered up against the Atlantic coast. Um, Colón is one of the poorest and most unemployed cities, actually the most unemployed city in the entire nation. The Free Zone and the city's three ports that accommodate uh, global logistical flow create exclusive spaces that end up segregating, constricting the city and its residents, which in turn um, extracting value from labor, its residents, and coastal ecology. The city first urbanized on Montanillo Island is now connected inland due to years of land reclamation for the expansion of the Cologne Free Zone and its warehousing sector. Systems of trade have materialized along Cologne's coastline over the past two decades, building an entire logistical cluster, or as they call them, assets, of shipping technologies and warehouses, which holds multiple departments and subcompartments that undertake the task of loading, unloading, warehousing, security, communication, and management for a global maritime market. Anchoring this city is the Colón Free Zone in blue, the oldest special economic zone in the nation. The entire logistic zone of Colón also contains three transshipment seaports along the coast in red, Mancenio International Terminal, Cristobal, and the Cologne Container Terminal, which are all directly connected to the Cologne Free Zone and managed by private global actors in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Seattle. <clears throat> these, um, these terminals support uh, the systems of movement through the multiple hubs within the zone and are managed by cutting edge technology that tracks import, export, and transshipment data through uh, every space and network. Cologne's logistical cluster prides itself as having one of the most comprehensive intermodal systems uh, and networks in the Americas, handling the highest cargo loads in Central America and the Caribbean. So the Cologne Free Zone, the most heterogeneous global space in Cologne, and also the oldest free zone in the region, since um, its construction over 10 special economic zones um, have been constructed in Panama, but none as large as the CFZ. The Cologne Free Zone is divided in two main sectors as you can see in blue, um, a primary area for the duty-free shops, which is on the left side, and that's divided by the canal. Well, now it's a canal after line reclamation. Um, and France Field, a storage hub for cargo in proximity to the ports. Companies operating within the zone obtain some of the highest tax benefits that include zero tariffs on imports and exports to foreign countries. As a response to a recent decline in productivity, the Colum Free Zone, in the Colum Free Zone, particularly due to trade disputes with Colombia and Venezuela, a new law was enacted to create more competition. So with the law uh, number eight in 2016, multinational corporations can now establish offices within the zone, as well as logistic call centers. These new reforms um, for capital liberalization in Colón, and as well as in Panama's other economic zones, um, there's I think up to 10, and they're constructing another one now. Um, like Panama Pacifico and its banking sector have transformed the nation from merely a, a place for convenient flow to a strategic logistical hub that adds value to commodity transport through a large network supply chain that cuts time and space dramatically. The logistics revolution in the past half century um, have facilitated the movement of commodities and bodies across geographical space. Capital, which Marx famously notes, strives to annihilate this space with time, reducing a minimum the time spent in motion from one place to another. Therefore, time and speed are necessary for the production of profit. Innovations in infrastructure and transport technologies become a necessary expense in order to reduce time, in order to create profit. The geoengineering of terrain to construct canal systems has immense impacts on global trade, and canals dramatically cut distance and time for their final destinations. The most significant trade routes in Panama, uh, using the Panama Canal, uh, are between the east coast of the United States and East Asia, followed by um, South America and the east coast of the United States. So these flows are mediated, controlled, and prescriptive, 
um, and therefore do not occur obviously naturally. On one side, I'm highly interested in how logistical science, technology, and infrastructure does this. Those with the control over logistical flow have the ability to slow down and speed up production as well as destination point. Colomb Free Zone is used primarily as a prime location for storage of goods as well as offering value-added services, um, less about manufacturing and more about moving things along. Companies who use these amenities include DHL, whose $30 million investment in a logistic warehouse in 2009 benefited from a flexible supply chain. With Colón as an operating node in Latin America, it was able to cut time and delivery significantly. Panama becomes the delivery mechanism to speed up the movement of goods through the Panama Canal and allow profit to accumulate without regulatory restrictions within the zone. So aside from mediated flow of logistical science and technology, legal mechanisms at the state and global level equally prescribe and control these networks, becoming a negotiation between multiple scales. There's a fluid bond between domestic actors, stakeholders in maritime processes, and supranational organizations that govern global systems. So my current thesis focuses primarily on um, the World Trade Organization and the United Nations uh, Conference on Trade and Development, as well as on the national level. Um, Panama has a logistics cabinet, which was formed in 2014. Um, but these two organizations, Supranational, uh, WTO and UNCTAD, um, as two important bodies that have helped cement trade globalization, well, some of, not all of them, but these two, um, through legal agreements and codes of norm. As members of these organizations and agreements, nation states waive all rights of control over protocols of trade. They are bound by the specific rules of an institution they are a part of. Uh, the recently ratified trade facilitation um, agreement of the members of WTO, an agreement between 135 nations and Panama joined in 2016, expedites the movement, release, and clearance of goods. What I found most interesting um, also is the new advance in Latin America, and actually I think globally that I'm looking more often, um, the single windows facilities, this implementation, uh, which is essentially new digitized systems uh, along with the TFA that promote an increased fluidity of logistics at the customs border. These systems become less regulated and more automated in order to maximize profit. So to shift back more towards the urban space, how do these processes end up affecting local ecologies in Colón? One thing is certain, the urban layout in Colón is dramatically shaped by these systems. There is one highway, so now we're kind of like shifting around and facing it from the Atlantic. One thing is certain, um, there's only one highway that enters the Casco Antiguo of Cristobal, which is the old town of Colón, through the Panama Colón Highway that eventually bleeds into El Paseo del Centenario, which runs all the way up to uh, Montenegro Island to the water. Rather than an island, though, land reclamation has formed the neighborhood into an artificial peninsula. The Casco Antiguo, the old town, is surrounded by these four massive structures that each are secured and enclosed. Therefore, the single entrance in and out of the city creates choke points for urban flows that are not associated with cargo transport. It limits the flows of bodies in and out of the space, as well as local logistical urban systems such as trash collection. Um, the residents become isolated from the rest of the province. It was observed during my research in earlier this year in 2018 that the interior and exterior of the spaces of the zone were extremely distinct, um, specifically in architecture, street planning, and cleanliness. So streets are perfectly paved, paved with a general sense of order, um, but outside of the zone, things are very much uh, different. The degradation of the neighborhood of the north, uh, north of the Colón Free Zone wall is the face of urban inequality. Poorly maintained structures and infrastructure, aesthetic facades, water systems, and public services are left to crumble. Uh, the amount of garbage along the streets was also really astounding. Even the dumpsters that collected trash appeared to be untouched. The city suffers from a poorly maintained sewage and drainage system that intensifies flooding during the rainy seasons. It is only until recent that these issues are being addressed by the government, but unfortunately at an extremely slow pace. And for some that I've spoken to in Colón, this signals corruption. There's an obvious paradox here. You have a city in decay neglected by the state alongside the largest export processing zone in the Western Hemisphere, which produces hundreds of million dollars per year. Um, and this is some of the flooding. Um, I had just arrived after a disastrous storm um, in early in January um, that carried uh, record rain. So garbage floated along the flooded streets like urban rivers as we drove through. Um, and it's also important to note that the Colón Free Zone uh, manages its own garbage disposal services that delivers trash to the same exact dump as the city's waste. 
So Cologne Free Zone and most free zone or export processing zones today act as enclaves whose high levels of infrastructural servicing and connectivity tend to contrast sharply from their surroundings. For the Cologne Free Zone, its expansion over the bay through reclamation has also caused trauma to rich ecosystems along the coastline. Mangrove deforestation has been a major consequence, which has increased flooding in the city. To add to this, new businesses um, in the free zone are built two to three feet higher than, cities, than the city's elevation, which disrupts natural water runoff and directs it towards a residential zone. Um, the government's neglect of financing and repair of new infrastructure and water pumps in the city, which are always filled with garbage, also perpetuates this flooding. In El Barrio Norte and Sud um, of, um, of, the, of Colón, which is in red, the water kind of flows down, and then naturally water should flow from the interior portion of the land towards the water, but now the Colón Free Zone is set around two to three meters higher. So that just ends up blocking and creating a flooding zone in the red spots. So further, a literal wall also surrounds the zone entirely and the border is highly secured. Legally, Panamanians are not allowed to enter the zone for fear of smuggling. These divisions of space are, not only, uh, are further highlighted with the growing unemployment level in Colón. Out of the 10 provinces in Panama, Colón has the highest unemployment rate uh, at 10% with an informal economy approximately at 37%. The Cologne Free Zone, which supposes to be a state instrument for economic development, employs only around 30% of Cologne residents out of approximately 30,000 persons. So if only a third of Cologne's population works in the zone, we could only assume that the remainder 20,000 plus employees travel from other provinces. How am I doing with time? Okay. Um, so I'll kind of jump into what I've been thinking about recently, probably in the past month and actually I'm interested in having a conversation with the previous four panelists, too. Um, so what we're doing is extremely necessary in terms of politicizing a generally apolitical topic. So now, kind of move in, I'm, I'm really interested in how can we determine more of a, a counter logistics. So social cooperation and class struggle um, um, and resistance go as far back in Panama to the construction of the canal. In the years that followed its development, Panama would witness a major surge in labor radicalism, specifically amongst black workers, mostly West Indian migrant, migrant workers who settled in Colón um, and also in the Canal Zone. More recently, numerous labor strikes during the Panama Canal expansion project halted the construction process um, in 2012 and 2015. In Colón, 20, in, in Colón in 2012, urban struggles with the contestation of public space was witnessed between the city um, of Colón and the state when hundreds of protesters in Colón lined the streets after the National Assembly approved the sale of the land in the CFZ. Demonstrators burned tires and clashed with the police for nearly a week after the government's announcement. Suntrax, the National Labor Union, led protests and managed to suspend the sale of the land of the free zone with the eventual repeal of the law. This is a major attempt to privatize public land without the consent, private land, um, without the consent of the Colón community. The struggle continues today. Earlier this year, on March 13th, 2018, protesters took to the street in violent clashes against police. The protest led by El Comité de Lucha por la Salvación de Colón, the Committee of, uh, for the Fight for the Salvation of Colón, paralyzed the city and a 48-hour strike ensued. El Comité voiced complaints that the current urban renewal project in Colón has a hidden agenda to gentrify and displace the community. They're actually building 45,000 affordable public housing outside of the city entirely on the other side of the airport. So they're, they're hoping to remove, well, I'm speculating too, but um, to remove all the residents from the area and eventually privatize that land. Of course, it's speculation, but we've seen this before. Um, where was I? So many believe the Renault project is more of a subversive and strategic method of privatization that was unsuccessful in 2012 with the attempt of the sale of land in the Cologne Free Zone. The city still suffers from poor water infrastructure and flood flooding years after the announcement to repair. The project is costing the government $500 million in Balboas, but it's, it's pegged one to one, and contract, contracted Odebrecht, the Brazilian construction firm who's involved in a bribery corporation scandal with more than 10 Latin American countries. El Comité has also announced another general strike, which began yesterday on the 19th, so it's kind of exciting to see what's happening now. So now time will only tell in the coming days what will happen in Colón, but for me, I'm highly interested in these forms of resistance that take flow and logistics into consideration. 
Blockades have historically been a common logistical tactic in military warfare, um, and economic infrastructures such as railways and highways and logistical flows have been localized as choke points um, where organized communities can leverage power. These tactics have um, almost intuitively been used for the past 200 years in response to wage cuts and poor working conditions. In Panama, these methods exist as well. Used especially by indigenous activists in 2012 and 2015, blockading the Inter-American Highway that connects all of Central America, protesting against the removal of mining laws that protected the land. This happened as well with the National Cargo Transportation Union in Panama and their blockade um, of the Costa Rican border in 2016. So strikes and blockades, as well as subversive, subversive sabotage, are effective for gaining leverage in specific cases, but are also limiting in structural transformation. The science of logistics is responsive to volatility and ability to shift and maneuver supply chains through computerized processes and algorithms for maximum profit. Jasper Burns notes that they are both offensive and defensive at once. So a more effective strategy, which I'm very interested in, but not also excluding the other tactics, I think it should be um, quite a mix, would be to construct networks of labor across supply chain to target specific choke points and weak spots for capitalist actors. A network and logistics of information is crucial for the offensive but can't be limited to one site or one scale. Thank you.